Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest will be at the Appalachian Center for the Arts in downtown Pikeville, Kentucky on Friday, September 17th. Joining me on the phone right now, the funniest man in America, James Gregory. James, how's it going today, buddy? Oh, I'm doing real good, and how about you? I'm doing real good. I'm really looking forward to the show this Friday. You know, I think that we could all use a few laughs nowadays. And not only that, I love going anywhere if it's in the state of Kentucky. I love the state of Kentucky. I've done a lot of shows in the great state of Kentucky over the past 35 years. So anytime I go to Kentucky, I just meet such wonderful people. And the audience is always just tremendous. I was in Elizabethtown this past weekend, for example, you know, and I go to Lexington at least once or twice a year. But it's been it's been quite a few years since I've been to Pikeville. So I'm looking forward to being in Pikeville again, you know. We are too, my friend. I think you're going to have a good time. We got some great people and we got some good food too. I know that food is something that you like to talk about a lot in your sets. What's some of your favorite Southern food there, James? Well, I love you. Know, in the past uh, 35 and 40 years, I've toured all over the United States and most of Canada. So I can find good food no matter where I'm at. The great thing about being in the Southeast, though, in the Southeast, okay, we are proud of our food. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Like, uh, we we, we brag about the food. We brag about our meatloaf. We brag about our barbecue, you know. But on the West Coast, they may have some good food, but to them... It's just something to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The people, like, the people like us, it's the reason we wake up in the morning. <laughs> you know, my dad used to say that the main conversation at lunch, okay, mm-hmm. was talking about what was going to have for supper. <laughs> <laughs> I like that right there. See, I, I'm a Georgia boy like you, so we know how to eat down there in the Peach State. One of my favorite Southern dishes that not a lot of Southerners know about, actually, is Brunswick stew. Are you a fan of that? No, Brunswick stew. I, I, it's hard to find Brunswick stew like in a restaurant, really. It has to be homemade Brunswick stew. But I love Brunswick stew, you know. There's a place just east of Atlanta, on Interstate I-20 East, around the Conyers area, where some of our kin folks live. Uh, they have an annual, it's a church they go to, and to raise funds for the church and people like that, they have a, an all-day Brunswick stew. Uh, what to do? Cook these and be, these big drums, these big drums, and they sell that Brunswick stew by the quart, about the gallon, and it's homemade. And they do that to raise funds for the church. So right now, as we speak, okay, (laughs) I have several jars of Brunswick Stew in my freezer right now. (laughs) Hey, buddy, it's some of the best stuff on planet Earth. The people that have never been to the Deep South before, I highly encourage anybody to get them some Brunswick Stew. I mean, it's good stuff. If you see any Brunswick Stew that does not have corn and lima beans, you just got green lima beans in that and corn. If you don't have that in the Brunswick stew, then you're not having the proper Brunswick stew. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if you can call it Brunswick stew if it don't have a little bit of corn in it. That's right. Exactly. You now, know, and you need some cornbread on the side. <laughs> buddy, I, I, I'm getting hungry here just now talking about all this. But I, I know oh, that I somebody it. doesn't get the uh, title, The Funniest Man in America, without putting in the work. How long have you been doing comedy there for, James? Uh, almost 40 years. Wow, that's that, that's amazing. It really is. How, how did you get your start in stand-up? Because I, well, I know back in the uh, the 80s, stand-up wasn't really a big thing in the South. You know, there, there wasn't a lot of clubs and stuff like that. So well, how does a Southern man back in the day get his start doing stand-up comedy? Well, I, yeah, it depends on what your age is to know what I'm about to say now. But prior, prior to 1982, the only place 
in the United States that you could see live, I'm talking about live stand-up comedy, was in California, like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cleveland, Ohio, Chicago, and a few places like that. But there was no such thing of live, live stand-up comedians working anywhere in the heartland or in the southeast. So the very first comedy club opened in the Southeast in 1982 in Atlanta, Georgia. It was the punchline. And I had always been a big fan of stand-up comedy. Now, I had never thought when I was younger that I wanted to be a comedian. I didn't, it never, that was a further thing from my mind. But I was a fan of stand-up comedy. And all the shows then, Eli, was Tuesday through Sunday. But Tuesday was what we call open mic night or amateur night. So me and two of my friends would go out there every Tuesday, not to be part of the show, but to watch the show. And I had friends who always thought that I was funny. They always thought I was cracking jokes. And they kept daring me to go on stage on open mic night. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And that's a brief story of how I got my foot in the water was amateur night at the punchline. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people uh, that are not familiar with the stand-up world, they you, you don't just become a uh, main act right away. You spend many, many, many no. years as an opening act. What were some of the first big there's acts that you started working with there? Well, there's a lot of what we call, there's a few years, there's a lot of years where it's the starving artist here, you know what I mean, where we're, where we're to starve to death, not making much money. But to give you an example of this, without taking too much of your time here, suppose that you were interviewing Jay Leno right now, or you were interviewing Jerry Seinfeld, or any of those guys, and you ask them, how did they start their career? They would tell you, open mic night. That's the only way you can start. See, it's a very unique business. It's not like you can go to school and get a diploma and now you graduate from a comedy school. You can't, it's not like being, being trained as an electrician or a plumber or a mechanic, you know. So you just start that way. As an example, you know, when I first met Tim Allen, we all know who Tim Allen is, right? Oh, yeah. Home improvement. The home improvement guy, okay. When I first worked with Tim Allen, Tim Allen was the feature act. There's always an opening act, a feature act, and then the headline. I knew Tim Allen when he was making 600 bucks a week. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and Tim Allen, for the people that are not familiar with his stand-up work, he was an incredible comedian. Incredible comedian. And so was Jay Leno. You know, I did a whole week of shows Tuesday through Sunday. I was the feature actor at that time, and Jay Leno was the uh, headliner. And uh, Jay Leno was a class act. There was a place across the interstate from the punchline, a steakhouse called the Beast Cellar. It was open at 3 a.m. So on the weekend, after the show, he would take me in the opening act to that steakhouse and pick up the tab and give us all kinds of advice. And then I got to hang out with... Uh, Stephen Wright for a whole week in Oklahoma, and uh, Jay Leno came to Oklahoma to do a big city sort of thing, and me and Stephen Wright and Jay Leno went out to dinner. So a lot of those guys, uh, if you think about Bob Newhart, most people think, well, that's because of that sitcom he had. But Bob Newhart was on the road a lot of years as a strict stand-up comedian. And it, like Ray Romano of Everybody Loves Raymond, Okay, when I first met him, he was a, a club act. He worked at comedy clubs. So that's what I'm saying. You have mm -hmm. to start somewhere. So you usually start at the lowest pay. Uh, you know, you don't pay. You don't make much money. But you just hang on and work hard, and things can happen. You know. Yeah, so, so many of the big entertainers nowadays started out as comedians. I mean, David Letterman, Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy, almost all of them got their start in stand-up. Exactly, you know. And some of those stars went on to be just superstars and sitcoms. And I never become a superstar, 
but I've always had a very, very successful career. I've been a lot of places and met a lot of people. And luckily, I don't want to brag, but usually I can sell out most of my shows. People still show up to see the show. And I think one reason they keep showing up to see my show is because my show is a completely family-friendly show. Any age group can come to my show, whether you're 12 years old or 18 years old or 88, you know. And I make sure that the show is hysterically funny from beginning to end. There's no profanity and there's no politics. I refuse to participate in current events. That's something I do not do. Because my philosophy is people watch the news 24 hours a day. They watch the news all the time. They can stay home and watch the news. I think when people go to a comedy show, and my comedy show usually lasts an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes, what they want to do is get away from the news, get away from that negativity, and show up and for a couple of hours just have a good time and just laugh and enjoy themselves. They don't need a comedian lecturing them on what politician we should vote for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that seems to be what a lot of stand-up has become. And, and also vulgar as well. It's kind of like with action movies nowadays. They think that they need to have more blood in it to be a good action movie. And when it comes to stand-up, the more F-bombs that you drop, the funnier you are. And I just don't think that that's the case. What made you want to go that style, though, working in clean comedy? Because there's not many comedians today that go with that style well there's probably more than you think it's just that uh you know i mean brian regan is one of the all-time greats you know uh it was it goes back a long time ago i mean i'm not i don't do it but i would call a christian show you know what i mean early in my career you know uh when uh my parents i was still the open act and my mom and dad and my sister came to see the show. And since they were in the audience, then I was real careful about some of the language I was using. And then afterwards, I was just thinking this to myself. I said, well, you know what? You didn't curse because your parents were here, because your mother was here. Well, all these other people in the audience, they are somebody's mother. They have sisters. So if I'm going to clean the show up for my parents, I must, I just, I might as well just clean the show up for all families, not just my family. And that was just my philosophy over 35 years ago. Yeah. It's a good philosophy to have because I think that some of the greatest comedians of all time have clean acts. Like you mentioned uh, Brian Regan there. He's one of my all-time favorites. And Jerry Seinfeld, Jim Gaffigan. I mean, the list goes on. And those are the acts that are still working today and still selling out arenas. So whenever it comes to the clean style, I, I wish that more comedians would go that route nowadays and realize you don't have to be vulgar to be funny. Hey, Rich Shod, do you remember Rich Shodner? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, I, I'm a big stand-up fan, so I know all these people that you're talking well, about. Well, you know, Rich, Rich Shodner has never cursed on stage. Yeah, and, and that used but to I, be a, a big style back in the day, and uh, nowadays I don't know yeah. what started it. I, I know the 80s uh, was pretty uh, crazy with Sam Kennison and Richard Pryor and all those guys coming in, and I do think that there's uh, different stand-up well, styles for everybody, but... I was a big fan of Richard Pryor. I still think Richard Pryor was a, one of the all-time greats. And Richard Pryor would use the foul language, but at least he had solid, solid, funny material that went with that language. Mm -hmm. A lot of comedians today just use the bad language to disguise the fact they're not very funny. <laughs> yeah, that, now, yeah that, that was a point that I was going to make there. I think that you see a lot of that in today's stand-up comedy. I mean, I don't criticize any of those guys because they have a following and there are people who love that kind of comedy and more power to them. I'm not being critical at all. If this mm -hmm. is America, there is the First Amendment, at least for now it is. <laughs> yeah. And people have different opinions 
and there's all kinds of comedy. I'm just trying to clarify the fact of my style in case your listeners have not seen my show. You can go to my website, which is funniestman.com. A lot of great stuff on my website. Go to my YouTube channel. There's a lot of funny, funny stuff on YouTube. A lot of the skits that I do, a lot of the routines that I do. And some of those sketches that I do, we've had some of those have received like 4 million views or 3 million views or 1 million views. So people love that stuff on YouTube, you know. Mm-hmm. So if you're not familiar with James Gregory, just go to my website, funniestman.com, or go to the YouTube channel, you know. But the main thing is make sure you make your reservations and get those tickets so you can see me in person, in person. <laughs> yeah, I, I encourage everybody to come out to your show because the thing that I like about your story is – well, the, your comedy is it's mainly stories about your family, friends, and real life events that's relatable. And and to me, that's what makes good stand up comedy is it's relatable. But the people in your stories, your family and friends, do they ever get mad about you talking about all this stuff on stage? You no, know what I do, I, I just I just change the name because <laughs> <laughs> I still got cousins. Who could kick my butt? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, that sounds familiar. But like, oh, no, no, I'm, t- I'm talking about Bill. That's who I'm talking about. Right. But I think the reason the audience loves the show is because they can relate. They can relate to the show. They can relate to what I'm talking about. Because sometimes before the show or after the show, uh, people will make comments to me. They'll say, I swear, you must have known my uncle. Or you remind me of my brother. Or, you know, we had a front porch just like that. See, people can remember that they lived a life like that. They had kid folks like that, you know. Mm-hmm. We all have crazy kid folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially we, here we, in the South, we love, buddy. We love them, but we know they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but I think that that's another great thing about your comedy, too, is, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of funny to it, but there's also a lot of truth to it as well. And the uh, kids that are brought along by their parents out to your show, I think that they can uh, learn a thing or two from these stories that you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you what I said one time. Uh, I get interviewed quite a bit with newspaper guys, the, the newspaper story, you know. And uh, a lot of radio, just like today, but a lot of these uh, newspaper reporters. And a few years ago, uh, uh, this young lady just asked me, she said, what do you think the difference is between kids today and kids in previous generations? I said, here's the difference. Kids today have 500 friends on Facebook and none on the front porch. Previous generations of kids, all their friends were on the front porch in the front yard. And those kids were happier than the kids today. That's just my opinion. You, you know, I, th- I do think that there's a lot of truth to that. I'm thankful that uh, my, my parents waited a little bit till they were up in age to have me. So they had a lot of old school values whenever they went about raising me. And I grew up in a little town called Hawkinsville, Georgia. And I mean, real oh, rural. You know I do a show in Hawkinsville every other year. Hey, I, I, I love it down there. That's that's where I'm originally from. And, and, I mean, I'm blessed to have the childhood that I did because, buddy, we grew up in the creek. We grew up in the front yard. And nowadays, my niece and nephews, I'm uh, trying to give them a little bit of direction, but every kid's just on a dang cell phone or on the Internet, and they had to get outside and get into the mud a little bit, I think. Yeah, get out there, you know, and go across the street, go across the road, talk to a neighbor across the street instead of, in your bedroom online to strangers. I don't have any friends that I've never met. How's that possible? These people think they have friends. They never met these people. These people are online. You know, I've never met them. How can you have 200 friends online on Facebook? You never met them. Yeah, exactly. And, and also just communicating online, too. I think that there's a lot of uh, loss 
uh, emotion there. I, you don't get the same emotion as actually sitting across from the table talking with somebody. And that's another thing, too, that burns me up, buddy, is whenever I'm in a uh, Golden Corral or something like that, and I'm looking around, and you got family sitting at the table on their cell phones. Whenever I was yeah, growing yeah, up, uh, buddy, the, the cell mom, phones were not the at the table. Dad, yeah, The mom and dad and the two teenagers are... Not talking to each other, like you just said, they're on the phone. They're just staring at their phone. <laughs> Buddy, if, if I was to bring my cell phone to the table growing up in my household, they would have shoved that thing down my throat. That would not have flew in my house. That's right. That's right. And also, if we were having dinner or lunch and the phone rang, we were not allowed to get up and go after the phone. My yep. mom would say, no, 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 yeah, they'll call back, they'll call back. Exactly. See, that, that, there's a lot of values that I think that you talk about in your stand-up comedy. Yeah, there's, there's great, funny stories, but there's values that I think the younger generation can learn a lot from. And that's why I appreciate you having a, a clean style to your comedy, is so that the parents can bring their kids out to the shows and the kids can learn something from these stories that you talk about. And the main thing is... Not only to learn something necessarily, but it will bring back great memories to those people. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they can laugh. You got to laugh and enjoy the show. Uh, you can't just uh, tell stories if there's not some humor. The humor is the main reason. That's why we're there. Is to make sure that the audience enjoys the show as far as laughing and smiling and having a good time. The bonus is, the bonus is, it just brings back great memories to you. How did you get the title, Funniest Man in America? How did that story come about? Well, it was not like a contest to be a thing. It was just completely accidental. And that was in 1986. I was doing a series of shows in Huntsville, Alabama. It was a comedy club, right? And the shows, as I said earlier, were Tuesday through Sunday. On Wednesday night, in the audience, was a newspaper reporter, a journalist. His name was Billy Joe Cooley. That's a great name, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's a great name. Now, what he did, he had two columns a week in what they call the lifestyle section of the newspaper. Uh, current events, what was going on, sports movies, theaters, that kind of stuff. Uh, reviewing uh, movies. Right? Well, he was in the audience, and he saw the show. That was on a Wednesday. So his column was published on a Friday. And in the story, he wrote about the comedy show, talking about me. And it's just a, a great story. He said, I never heard of this guy. I really don't know who he is. But he absolutely has to be the funniest man in America. Now, back in those days, Eli, when you got a good review like that, what people like I would do, we would get several copies of that, or we'd, we'd clip that story and make copies of it, and then we would forward that to our future engagements as part of a press keeping, okay? Mm -hmm. A press keeping. So a few weeks later, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, that's their major paper. In the entertainment section, it said, appearing this weekend, the funniest man in America, James Gregory. What they did, they took that, that paragraph from that review, and the second engagement was, I went from St. Louis, a whole week there in St. Louis, then I went down to Texas. I had to do a show in Amarillo, Texas. Okay? And the same thing happened. So I, I, I said, you know what? I might have found something here. I had the audacity that on my stationery and on my, my headshots and on my posters, I put in quotation marks, the funniest man in America. So it was no contest. I didn't win anything. It just, by circumstance, it just happened. And Billy Joe Cooley, I told people, I said, don't blame me, blame Billy Joe Cooley, you know. 
<laughs> hey, but somebody with a great name like that can give you a good name like Funniest Man in America. It was true back then, and it's true here in 2021. And, buddy, we are really looking forward to this show this Friday. Everybody get your tickets. It's going to be a good one. A big shout-out to the Appalachian Center for the Arts for having stand-up comedy in Eastern Kentucky. And, James, and James, it was an absolute honor. Thank you for your time today. Well, it's been my, and I will say this, Eli, before you hang up, and I'm not saying this because I'm talking to you. I have said this to many, many people over the years who, like you, are in the radio or local TV business. I appreciate everything that folks like you do. If it were not for the radio people, and I don't mean national radio. I know I'm a regular on the John Bull Billy Show. But these local radio people, uh, when I say local, I don't mean tiny, tiny. I just mean they're not nationwide. But if not for the radio people who gave me this time on the air, if not for people like you, Eli, I would have been out of business a long time ago. So I appreciate everything you folks do. Well, buddy, thank you for those kind words. It means a lot coming from the funniest man in America. And thank you for all that you do, too. You know, I think that folks need to laugh nowadays more than they ever had before. So thank you for keeping us laughing and smiling. That's what we're going to be doing this Friday, folks. Get your tickets today. And James, thanks again, buddy. Thank you, sir.